Okay, we're uh, going to be doing Acts chapter 22 now, page 259 in your notebook if you're following along there. And uh, uh, just to kind of review where we've been, chapter 22 is Paul's defense. Uh, in Jerusalem, he is under the guard and protection of Roman soldiers. Um, there's been quite a tumult, is the King James word, as a result of Paul's uh, arrival in Jerusalem at Pentecost. He's created quite a stir. There are those who have uh, uh, determined that they're going to eliminate him, assassinate him. Uh, they bring up false charges, religious charges against the Apostle Paul. Uh, a Roman uh, dignitary, soldier, uh, commander, realizes that, uh, that this situation is absolutely out of control, uh, chaos. He intervenes. He rescues Paul while he is um, incarcerating him or will be incarcerating him. And he's protecting him. And Paul says, hey, listen, I want to take a chance. I want to have an opportunity to address these people who are all upset with me. Well, the Roman soldier decides that he'll give him the opportunity to do that. He says, go for it, man, right now. And that's what chapter 22 is all about. So if you go back to chapter number 21, just want to read the end of that. You can see it says in verse 40, And when he had given him license, Paul stood in the stairs and beckoned with his hand unto the people. And when there, were, was made a, there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, and chapter 22 is what he said, Men and brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith, I am verily a man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, of city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. Now many years have transpired since Acts chapter, I believe it's chapter 5, when Gamaliel was mentioned. Uh, so we're talking 15 years or more anyway. It could be 20 years, something like that. I'd have to look at my chart to actually pin that down. But it's been many years uh, since then. And uh, Paul has gained a, a, uh, quite a reputation among Jews. But the good things about Paul or the things that were historically true about Paul, they've kind of been lost in all of the hubbub about who, who he is, what he's doing, um, his antagonism to Judaism, his hatred for the law, the temple, etc., etc., and of course his love for Christ. All of these things have been really trumped up, no doubt, to the degree that uh, who Paul was has been lost in all of, all of the rhetoric that's been spread about him. So he says, I'm going to take the time right now, and I'm going to tell you who I am. He says in verse 4, and I persecuted this way, Christianity. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The term way shows up several times with reference to the gospel of Jesus Christ in the book of Acts. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. I was a fanatic against Christianity and against Christ. As also the high priest doth bear, doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. Uh, Paul was a radical Hebrew Pharisee. He went about searching, seeking out Christians, particularly Jewish Christians, people who had turned from Judaism to Christianity and had them prosecuted and persecuted for what they believed. It says that he brought them bound unto Jerusalem 
for to be punished. So, the Hebrew tongue, the Hebrew tongue here, uh, probably would be Aramaic, which was the common Hebrew tongue of, of its day. Gamaliel shows up in Acts chapter 5, verse 34, we mentioned on page 260, and then this way, Jesus is the way, and we've noted there in your uh, notes uh, several other places where that term has been used. It's a reference to the gospel ministry, the preaching of the gospel ministry. So we pick up in verse uh, 6 of chapter 22, Paul gets knocked off his high horse. You've heard that saying before, and we're going to read about it again in chapter 22. It came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid. But they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. So they, those that were accompanying Paul had part of this experience, but not the full or complete experience. And they that were with me saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice, verse 9. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it should be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. I've got great plans for you, Paul. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, this is why he was blinded. He was blinded by the brightness of the glory of of an appearance of Jesus Christ to Paul, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. So he fell to the ground. We often use the term, as I mentioned a moment ago, that he was knocked off his high horse. This is a, an image that comes from the Bible, from the life and conversion of the apostle Paul. We noted also the great light that's mentioned, probably something of the, the Shekinah glory of God that was uh, uh, part of the tabernacle, maybe the transfiguration appearance of Christ in Matthew chapter uh, 20, uh, Matthew, excuse me, Matthew chapter 17, and then Revelation chapter 22 talks about that great light. Uh, the implication, of course, in 22.7 is that Saul was directly persecuting Christ. Persecuting one of his people is persecuting him personally. Well, let's pick up the reading in chapter 22, page 261, verse number 12. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Again, we need to be careful when we're going through the book of Acts that we don't pick out one particular verse of Scripture that describes some of the aspects of an individual coming to Christ as Savior and then taking that one verse and making that the model uh, for a salvation. There are several passages. Uh, we can look at Acts chapter 2 for one. We can see the preaching of Peter in Acts chapter 3. We could uh, see the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter number 8. We could see the conversion of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Uh, we could go to Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer. And you're going to find all kinds of different 
phrases mentioned in relationship to the conversion of those individuals. And of course, uh, Paul's original conversion experience is recorded in chapter number 9 of Acts. It's recorded for the second time here in chapter number 22, but it's recorded a third time in chapter number 26. And comparing all three of those, you can learn something uh, different uh, from about Paul and about his conversion from each of those three records in Scripture. So, um, 22, 12 through 16, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If that's the formula, if that was the formula, you're not going to find this in Acts chapter 10. It's just not there. You're not going to find it in Acts chapter 16. But if this was the only passage concerning salvation, you could say salvation comes by being baptized, your sins are washed away, and then you call upon the name of the Lord. Of course, the Bible says in Acts, or excuse me, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, uh, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The, uh, in verse 13, in that same chapter, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's Romans chapter 10, verse number 13. But there's no baptism that's even mentioned there in that, uh, in that text. So we need to be careful not to derive our uh, model for salvation from one specific or particular passage of Scripture, particularly from the book of Acts, because there are several different records there. Anyway, Ananias, uh, if you're looking at your notes, 261, this passage doesn't tell us, but chapter 9 tells us that Ananias had been warned of the coming of Paul. He knew that uh, the type of individual that he was going to have to deal with. Uh, if you want to turn the page, you can see 2215 at the top of 262. 2215, for thou shalt be his witness. And again, we've listed several places, not all of them, but several places where this is a key term, a key description of what a Christian is to be. We are witnesses. Like in a court of law, we are called upon, it is our responsibility to tell others what we know and believe to be true about Christ, about the gospel, about our sin, about salvation. We are witnesses of the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and right where you are today in the uttermost part of the earth. So, we want to go now to uh, verse 17 of chapter 22. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am prisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believe on thee. When the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, and consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. So, Again, Paul is sharing his testimony with these individuals, and this is what has taken place in my life. He's sharing with them his conversion from being a radical anti-Christ uh, Jewish uh, disciple, a disciple of the law, to becoming pro-Christ, speaking of his conversion, speaking of trust in Christ, and becoming a witness and an emissary for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, then his commission, I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles, verse 21, 22, 21. So we pick up in verse number 22 of chapter 22. And they gave him audience unto his word. 
They listened and then lifted up their voices and said, oh, (laughs) his testimony was not received well. Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Well, they're not convinced. They had their minds made up, and Paul's testimony didn't move them uh, toward, uh, favorably towards him. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle. This was getting a little bit out of hand. He gave Paul the opportunity to share his testimony. He's done that. The people have not received it well. And the chief captain says, we better get him inside here before we don't have the ability to protect him anymore. And bade bade that he should be examined by scourging that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. So Paul has given his testimony. The chief captain is listening to this and he's wondering, Uh, What is the offense here? There's got to be something more to this story than what we have just heard here. Um, Look at these people. They're beside themselves. They want to kill this guy. So the chief captain, to protect him first, brings him inside and says, okay, we're going to find out what the real story is. Let's beat it out of him. And that's exactly what we're reading about here in uh, chapter number 22. Let's beat it out of him. So verse 24, that he should be examined by scourging that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. It was unthinkable to the Jews in Jerusalem God's plan would include sending a Jew to Gentiles without requiring Gentiles to observe the law. The... the, um, Jews were very prejudiced, very prejudiced against the Gentiles. They were the chosen people. In their minds, they were top shelf. Everybody else existed somewhere below them in the pecking order, somewhere below them. It was, it, this was just something that was not, uh, 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 un, it was unthinkable for them. Jewish ethnocentrism, we call it, taught that no Jew should admit that Jews and Gentiles could know God on equal footing apart from the institutions and traditions of Judaism. Now, you could come into Judaism and be trained in what we know to be true, but anybody on the outside had, uh, did not uh, understand the truth and what, what, what reality, re- spiritual or religious reality is all about. In chapter 2, in verse uh, uh, in, in 24, where we talk about the chief captain there, we find out in chapter 23 that his name, or we found out that his name was Claudius Lysias was his name. The chief captain decides that Paul's guilty of something, so he's going to beat it out of him. And the crowd has turned on Paul, just as the crowd it turned on Jesus. Un, well, we could say unfortunately or fortunately, Pilate uh, was a coward. We know that. We know that Christ had to die. He had to be buried. He had to rise from the dead. We know that. That's God's plan. But at the same time, we know that Pilate had a free will and he acted in a cowardly way. Different from Claudius Lysias. Although Claudius Lysias decided he'd beat it out of him, I think Pilate was part of that also. He still uh, protected him by keeping him in-house. So Paul now reveals his Roman citizenship. Um, Claudius Lysias didn't really understand, he didn't understand who Paul was. Paul is revealing a little bit at a time as to who he was, his testimony uh, of salvation. Now he's going to say, listen, you want to beat me? Well, before you scourge me, you need to stop for a moment and think about who you are beating. 
And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, he asked him a question, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? He hasn't had a trial and he has not been convicted. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, You better watch out, take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. You're about to scourge to beat a Roman citizen uncondemned. Then the chief cap captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. In other words, the chief captain bought his way, bought his citizenship uh, from Rome. And Paul said, but I was freeborn. I didn't have to pay for it. I'm a natural Roman citizen. You're a, an individual that had to come into Roman citizenship through money, by purchase. I'm the real deal. I'm a natural, I'm a natural citizen of Rome. So, verse 29, Then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him, and the chief cap captain also was afraid. He uh, may have stepped on some toes here. He might have gone out outside the guidelines of, his, of the law, of Roman law. After he knew that he was a Roman and because he had bound him, he had already done something against Roman law. On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty whereof he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all the council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. So I suppose Claudius Lysias has decided, okay, now I, I've got a, a little better understanding of what's going on here. I haven't heard anything from Paul that he has done, that he's admitted, that uh, there's any civil guilt. I'm not even sure why I'm involved in this now, other than I'm protecting a Roman citizen, which I didn't know he was a Roman citizen before. So I'm going to get to the bottom of this. So we're going to have another little meeting, another little get-together. And that's what verse number 30 is all about. Paul is playing his citizenship card. He's kind of kept this in his back pocket until the right time. It's time now before this beating that he's about to get. This is time to pull the citizenship card out to protect himself. The uh, verse 29 says that he was afraid because he bound him. Uh, he hid, apparently violated the Roman law himself. In miracle of miracles, Claudius says, I'll settle this by having a civil and decent meeting of the mind. So why don't we call these Jewish people in here and we'll talk about it. This is uh, irony, is it not? The Lord affords Paul the opportunity to witness under the most extreme circumstances. I mean, he's on the verge of being assassinated. A secular Roman government individual, uh, official, protects him from the Jews and actually calls a meeting and will secure the meeting to the degree that Paul can get up and turn this situation into a great gospel opportunity, an opportunity to once again share what the Lord has done in his life. Verse number 30. So if we turn the page in page 264, we can uh, learn here uh, some lessons from the text that God can turn your obstacles, and this is a big obstacle, but Paul saw, we looked at it in our last lesson, Paul saw going to Jerusalem as a win-win situation. If he lost his life, he fought a good fight. If he doesn't lose his life, he has an opportunity again to witness and fulfill the gospel ministry that Christ has given to him. And look at all the different people now that Paul is having the opportunity to share his personal testimony with. It's really incredible. God can turn your obstacles 
into opportunities. Learn to carefully, number two, choose your words and minister grace to your audience. Uh, I have a little acronym, THINK. Before you speak, THINK. THINK. T stands for, is what I'm going to say the truth? H stands for helpful. Is what I'm going to say helpful? I. I. Is it important? Sometimes we just keep talking and talking about things that are unimportant. Is what I'm going to say important? N. Is it necessary? Is it necessary? When responding to close family members and casual conversation, we feel very free about saying what's on our mind. You need to stop. You might save yourself some problem with your husband, your wife, a close relative or friend by asking yourself before you say what you're about to say, is it really necessary that I save this, say this? And then K stands for kind. Is what I'm going to say kind words are powerful and they can unite or they can divide your personal story or testimony is a powerful tool for communicating the truth of the gospel number four know your audience and find common ground paul was wise very wise in how he dealt with people he always told them the truth but he always found a way to get into the minds of the hearers. And it could be to irritate them, or it could be to get them to stop and think about what he was saying from a perspective that they had never considered. Understand that your witness should so simply try to persuade, not to coerce. I'm a witness, telling the truth. I'm putting it out on the table. Now, the Holy Spirit of God needs to take the truth Work it in the mind, the heart, the conscience of that individual to bring about fruit unto salvation or fruit where a person will move closer and closer and closer to accepting the truth of Christ as Savior. But it is not my responsibility to coerce people into salvation. I've listed several th thoughts there. And God is looking to redeem all, not just Jews or Americans and not just moral people so this is uh this is chapter number 22 and uh, we're moving along the story moves along pretty quickly we're going to take a break here and we're going to come back and we're going to continue the story we said uh, the second half of the book of acts is broken up into five major pieces three missionary journeys we've been through all of them the council at jerusalem chapter 15 that's four. The fifth major thing is what we're reading about now. This is Paul's trip to Rome and all of the people that he was able to influence on his way to Rome to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might even look at this as his fourth missionary trip. So we'll take a break right now. We'll come back and we'll be in chapter number 23.